very important investing in people, investing in the human capital, and definitely also investing in uh, education. Professor, how do you see uh, this sense of investment in the human capital uh, bearing into consideration Egypt's vision 2030? Um, clearly, what I see is that it's not only important, but it's the most important investment that anyone can have, particularly Egypt. Mm -hmm. And uh, you just mentioned something extremely important, which is the new republic, yeah. the new era, the new horizon, the new challenges. How can you do that? How can you face that without a prepared generations, uh, not only through e good education, but education, self-education and knowledge mm -hmm. uh, in general. Uh, I like also in your introduction, you mentioned the fact to be able to face these challenges to be able to cope this educational system with the industry, with, with the world of work, uh, with the market needs. These are the aspects that were for long missing in our educational system. And thanks God over the past few years, let's say six, six, seven years, this has been gradually, but really aggressively being uh, fixed in a very positive way. Yeah. So I'm, I'm truly optimistic about what's going on and definitely a most important investment that anyone can have. Uh, it is and uh, New Egypt is a country that really focuses on the attainment of knowledge. Uh, mind you that we do have uh, many ways that would foster that like uh, uh, paying special attention for instance to artificial intelligence as well and uh, technology as a very important uh, component since uh, during COVID we have all experienced also uh, remote learning. So we do have more than one tool here combined. Uh, a set of tools mm -hmm. uh, and all ed new educational system or e emerging uh, education system after the COVID are no longer going to rely on going back only on face-to-face -face education, the traditional one. Uh, we all know that through crises, through, through difficult times, there are opportunities and uh, as I mentioned, new horizons are open. And in this regard, new tools, new means for education and for acquiring knowledge uh, are being created. And I don't know of any single institution, uh, not only in Egypt, but worldwide, that's not changing its delivery means, uh, its readiness. And what happened uh, through COVID, heaven forbid, could be repeated in different shapes and forms. Mm -hmm. And that should by no means stop the learning process, the involvement of our students. Uh, something that's not tangential, as a matter of fact, it's the, to the core of discussion. You're talking about Egypt, a country of 105, you know, more or less of million individuals. Put on top of that, like um, young generations, uh, age bracket is uh, young. Yeah. So, so you, you are delivering education to the largest sector of the society, young age, and that applies to Egypt, that applies to most of the countries in Africa as well. Mm -hmm. So it, it targets those who need it, it targets those who are going to build your future. Yes, uh, and while talking about building the future, we, we saw together earlier the presidential activity and as uh, His Excellency has uh, visited the military academy, one of the most uh, re reputable military uh, institutions in the region. And uh, he had also breakfast with the cadets, uh, raising their morale and sharing them the exercises. Uh, from the uh, eyes of a champion, how do you see the importance uh, of uh, uh, such a healthy spirit that we saw earlier in the day. Uh, of course, side by side with education. D definitely. Mm -hmm. And since you mentioned that, uh, uh, the Egyptian military is highly ranked worldwide. Uh, we are not a country who is offending others, but we are securing ourselves. We are um, securing our, our, our interests and the interests of, of our friends and our region. But not only that the Egyptian uh, army is highly ranked, but the, the, the military college or the military academy is one is becoming one of the top 21s worldwide. And that's why it's not a surprise for you to see many of the uh, individuals coming from other countries, from, from, from uh, Arab countries, African countries, to receive their education as cadets in the Egyptian military school. Uh, having said that, I would say that <coughs> definitely the, the, the president and visits not only at that hour, but that, fre but that frequent, 
these visits are not once uh, every mm -hmm. few years. They happen once every few months, if not few weeks. Yes. So it's to follow up on that and to send the very important message to the Egyptian people mm -hmm. that our military is ready, that our cadets are being well prepared to undertake their future tasks, uh, which are challenging, but God protect them and God protect you. Yes, God bless and also uh, sharing and joining them in doing some exercises. Uh, very healthy to start off the day at dawn, uh, yes. early in the morning and uh, uh, doing some uh, exercises. What would you tell and what would you advise parents who would like uh, their kids to, to study hard but would not that much uh, take good care of their uh, physical uh, capabilities or uh, exercise. It's a huge mistake, but as a matter of fact, you're opening very interesting topics that I would love to talk about them for hours. But there, it's a great feeling for anyone to start the day by doing some sports. And again, as I once mentioned, I was honored to be your guest a few months ago in which I mentioned you don't have to be a champion. Mm -hmm. You don't have to compete for a medal, although it's nice and it's something to be proud of. But start the day by a walk. Walk with a friend, walk alone, w walk and, 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 and think about uh, your plan of the day. And early in the morning when it's less noisy, when it's less traffic, uh, it definitely gives you a, bo a boost. I, I wouldn't talk too much because everybody knows that the, the health benefits mm -hmm. come there, but I'm talking also about the psychological benefit, the good feeling that, that your body is moving and so on. And definitely, I think we all know that many, if not most, of the people who have excelled academically or prof and professionally have been people who have been maintaining this good balance between their physical exercises and their commitments, whether they are academic or professional. So definitely, parents and the individuals themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the one thing I want to say also to everyone, sometimes you would feel that you're lazy, you don't want to get up, or I'm too tired to do that, maybe I'll do it tomorrow. And I say that's exactly the moment you have to do it. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you train yourself to beat the feeling of slowing down, and that's why universities, and, and I'm glad I, if I go back to, 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 to your, your important topic here, most reputable universities in the world. Mm -hmm. l l look, first, they allocate a good percentage of their scholarships to those who excel in sports. And that will boost also the whole level of sports and physical fitness of the entire community within the university. Yeah. But on the other hand, also, they, they encourage people to, to have these great facilities. And uh, all the world champions were, were one day champions of their own universities. Yes, uh, they do. The president's initiative concerning building the Egyptian character is actually limitless. And this uh, was made uh, clear through the presidential initiative, uh, the Decent Life Initiative. And uh, among the top priorities also for the new republic is uh, changing uh, concepts concerning uh, quality of education at uh, the different levels. And I know that you give many lectures, Professor. Uh, concerning uh, academic integrity uh, around yes. the world. Uh, effective awareness is considered to be actually key if we're talking here uh, how to foster uh, academic uh, integrity concepts. Um, let me say uh, an important thing here. Uh, and, and speaking of that, minutes before I came to, 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 to this nice show here, uh, debate, uh, I was invited uh, by internationally for the 30th anniversary for uh, celebrating uh, the establishment of the Center of Academic Integrity. Um, you know, the viewers perhaps know that when we talk about integrity, we talk about not only the academic uh, performance, we talk about the behavioral aspects. And your question is, is, is truly uh, um, touching the point because you did not talk only about the educational part, talk about the character, building the character. Building the character takes more than education, talk about behavioral aspect, talk, talk about performing, mm -hmm. uh, uh, about uh, not just preaching, but practicing w what you're doing. And it's quite a complex issue uh, uh, that's being well tackled in a time that the challenges uh, uh, are mounting. Yeah. Uh, uh, people are compete, com level of competition worldwide in jobs, in doing things is, is much higher. The, 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 the economic crises here and there, uh, I, I don't want to be pessimistic, but the, ho the whole world is in a state of, let's say, uh, a bit of instability or instability that perhaps could encourage people to go to cut corners or to try to, to save this and that. So 
it's a building a character that's able to not only to receive education but to educate itself and really possess a true uh, uh, behavioral uh, uh, and performance uh, aspect that could be a role models for others and this is part of the the new education system and the changes are taking place on the scene. Yes, uh, uh, more than one important event are actually taking place in Egypt and more than one reputable selection. Egypt selected to host the COP27 the COP in Sharm el Sheikh uh, in uh, November, upcoming November, November of 2022. This is a great achievement yes. and it's, uh, it's also uh, great in the fact that it is helping in branding Egypt uh, globally. Uh, as a whole and educators around the world also in the field of uh, uh, climate are going to attend uh, we have different countries uh, attending also african countries and egypt's collaboration with africa since our uh, fruitful uh, chairmanship of the african union uh, has been uh, quite evident and present so how do you see the training of uh, the teams beforehand before hosting such uh, important events uh, l let me say something that I was talking about a few days ago. Uh, Egypt hosting the COP27 is perhaps, in my view, the most reputable, uh, let's say, uh, I don't want to exaggerate, but uh, convention or confer conference or global event that's being hosted by Egypt. Why am I saying that? If Egypt hosts something about political issue, about a conflict, or about something in the region or the Middle East, it's understood because Egypt is part of it right but now Egypt is dealing with something that's truly mm -hmm. global and Egypt is not and the far top away. priority for the world I mm. I haven't been um, and thank you for saying that I haven't been to a single academic conference mm -hmm. I haven't watched any political debate or candidates whether in Europe in the Middle East and elsewhere without having climate change as a top item in the agenda yeah. but it's not just hosting uh, you know and the viewers perhaps know that uh, Egypt is one of the countries that can be heaven forbid harmed the most by climate change all the northern coast uh, parts of it could be under threat mm -hmm. the, the, the east uh, in, in, in the uh, Red Sea as well uh, you mentioned uh, eloquently Africa yeah. Afri Africa and uh, is a continent 54 countries out of these 54, 42 countries are severely, or can be severely, I don't want to say will, heaven forbid, but can be severely uh, affected. And this effect has already started. Uh, and the, the, this flooding the, that happened south of Sahara a few weeks ago. So you, you talk about uh, a region that Egypt is, is leading. Uh, of course, I say Egypt is leading because Egypt is um, uh, uh, a true pivotal country in Africa. We left the chairmanship of Africa and still very heavily involved two years ago, yeah. and we're still heavily involved in that, but definitely it's uh, something to be proud of. Mm -hmm. uh, on the peripheral of that, I want to say something, and I don't really mean to talk about myself, but I want to talk about my students. My students now are, of course, I happen to be advising them, uh, doing a research on climate change, how it affects uh, mm -hmm. our buildings, for example, our coast, uh, how it will affect not only Egypt, the whole uh, From the eyes of a, con of a yes. professor of construction engineering, uh, in what way uh, are uh, the different hazards that are being posed by uh, climate change today uh, affecting our, uh, our buildings, the future of, uh, uh, of building and construction in your opinion? Um, I, I will answer in a, well, of course, it's, it's a huge or, or significant effect. Anyone who goes to Alexandria, uh, and I mean not the North Coast Alexandria, the old beautiful Alexandria, the coasts are eroding. Mm -hmm. And this, this, this hasn't started yesterday or it has been happening, but increased over the past five or six years more. You would see these blocks being put in different shapes. Some of them are like tripod like that to try mm -hmm. to minimize this coastal erosion. So to, to address your beautiful question, the sea level is going higher. Uh, much of the, of course, I say that not in a pessimistic tone, but I say it in a, in a cautionary tone. If we don't do something, much of the delta land mm. could be uh, um, uh, underwater, um, area in Bahira, Kafri Sheikh, yeah. and so on. And the groundwater will, 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 will be going higher. So you'll have serious problems 
uh, in, in many of the buildings, particularly in the coastal area. Mm -hmm. And here I will end by saying one thing in response to this question. And therefore, we have not only to do something about climate change, but we, the way we build, the way we do things, not only in building industry, we have to take climate change well into our consideration. Because uh, things are different. Yes, definitely. And uh, from uh, uh, climate change and this important topic, while we are addressing also the environment, there has been more remote learning with experts in the environmental field uh, all over the world uh, and um, also uh, pending the safety and health of the students uh, during COVID emerged here. Uh, the importance and uh, the necessity of having what we call remote learning. And uh, uh, you've addressed before, Professor, uh, more concerning and, and wrote also about the, the classroom sizes. So uh, do you think that uh, the introduction of remote learning is going to contribute uh, to solving uh, such a challenge that has been pending for a while? Uh, definitely it's a plus. Mm -hmm. Definitely it's a plus. And when I say it's a plus, it's not a plus only because of COVID or any, heaven forbid, similar uh, pandemic or any kind of, of health issue. You are, once, once we further master it, let me tell you about my, my own humble experience. The first semester I taught uh, through online, definitely the second semester I was better. Uh, mm. in, in, in the way of delivery itself. Yes. The students or the recipients, on the other hand, the way to get them involved. And I have to say to, to, to you and the viewers that we, and, and we are professors for a long time, but we are receiving continuous training on how to do things better when it comes to remote uh, learning. But it will open other opportunities that were not there before. Mm -hmm. My class could be sitting remotely with other people in Harvard or Stanford or uh, or, or in Tokyo or in uh, Mozambique and, and having joint cooperation, go, joint discussion. Uh, uh, and, and this does not have to be totally remote learning. Opportunities will come in the right time where we have face-to-face -face and interaction and perhaps laboratory work. So it, I want us not to think of it as a mean to solve a problem, which is the pandemic, but as something that emerged that can help our educational system become better. Mm -hmm. And I remember in, in a previous uh, discussion uh, that we talked about the, the classroom size, and you just pointed out to that now, haven't we been complaining for decades our classroom sizes in, in the schools are 70 or 60 or 50 or 80 or so, huge numbers, and it's not healthy. I'm talking here about without COVID. Now you have the opportunity to use virtual classrooms. Yes. You don't have to bring them all the same day. Mm -hmm. And in many places and in many universities, they don't have all to come the same day. Today, this group will come mm -hmm. and tomorrow they will be at home and the other group will come the other day. We, they call it the dual delivery or the multiple delivery. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, you make best use out of, of, of your facilities. Not to mention things like storms, uh, rains. Haven't we closed the schools? all over the world, I'm not talking only about Egypt, because of snow in, in, in Europe and America and be, because of rain sometimes here and or yes. winds and, and, and storms and things. You are going to combat that by good infrastructure, technological one, that will allow education to continue in a good way. Yes, uh, combat that by, um, by good approaches also and uh, the blended approach, educational approach. Actually, has that's been, the right term, the blended learning. The yes. blended learning approach has been uh, there also in place. And uh, how about the pros and cons vis-a-vis -vis the student's performance, in your opinion, Professor? Um, uh, it's a good question because I have to think about giving you a conclusive answer. Pros. Uh, in brief, uh, enhancing your capacity, uh, opening, as I just mentioned, opportunities with other individuals. Uh, if the professor or the researcher himself is not feeling well, uh, he can deliver it from home uh, because if anyone has symptoms of anything, he shouldn't go to the workplace. The, the, these are, of course, the obvious ones, but I have to stress further and further and further, it's making us doing things differently. These mm -hmm. people you mentioned at the, at the introduction, they are going to work uh, afterwards and much of the opportunities lie in virtual works, in people, uh, you don't have to see them mm -hmm. uh, and they finish the work like that. The main disadvantage is that we don't want that to be on the 
uh, expense of the human context, the human feelings, the, the interaction that doesn't have to be too close to each other, sitting too close to each other. Uh, the, the being in your office and responding to questions. Uh, sharing activities. Is, is learning only a classroom or it has to do with, with going out, going into some meaningful activities, visiting museums, uh, uh, concerts, uh, 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 sports, uh, uh, competition and so on. So these are the things that we want to integrate in a good way and I think it's happening uh, gradually. Yeah, from your words, Professor, we have more than keywords here, like uh, integration and also is learning all only uh, through a classroom? Of course not. We do have uh, more than one uh, uh, variety of choices. That's why uh, Egypt has been opening up to the world in the field of education, witnessing revolutionary developments in more than one field. And all those are components of the new republic. Uh, for instance, we uh, are having today in Egypt a city for gold. And uh, this is in the new administrative capital, capturing headlines around the world, uh, the city of gold in itself. We have a pharaoh of gold, King Tut, and today also a city of gold uh, in the new administrative capital. Establishing a city of gold has been also unconventional, including nearly 400 workshops for the production of gold uh, and also other educational workshops. And this leads us uh, to more than one interesting story since we are talking about education and the classroom, we have also to talk about uh, vocational training and uh, the new style while, while talking uh, education. We're still uh, with you on the show live uh, tonight from Cairo on Wednesday debate. And I have all the honor of having with me Professor Dr. Mohammed Nagib Abu Zaid, uh, professor at AUC. And together we are reading the uh, education file today. Short break, we'll be back. So, Professor, we were talking about uh, vocational training, and uh, since we were talking about the city of gold, uh, this is also very important. Uh, uh, vocational uh, training, vocational education is considered to be essential uh, in the time being, and also for uh, preparing a new cadres for the labor market. Uh, I, I will start by saying the top 10 uh, growing uh, economies in the world are the same top 10 categorized countries in the level of vocational training. So I don't think I can provide any stronger evidence that the, with, with the how parallel, how essential vocational training is, mm -hmm. uh, technical education and vocational training, to the growth of any nation and to the economic growth, as you pointed out in your question. Uh, and for long, we have always considered voc vocational education as a side issue. Variety of reasons, we can discuss them at length sometime, but top one in my view was the lack of integration and the, it has been for decades uh, a supply driven, not a demand driven. You supply something and you ask your taxi driver with all due respect, or somebody who's selling something in a supermarket, what's, what's your, your, your vocation? He said, I, I learned to become, for example, a welder, or a, carp a carpenter, yeah. or something. Yeah. Something that reflects on the economy that the opportunity has been for free wasted, and he's not fitting that into the market. You don't create the jobs uh, for that. Uh, your question brings another thing that's quite important, which is it's not also the, 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 or as usual, the, 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 the conventional vocational training. Mm -hmm. You want vocational training uh, that has to do with, with, with fixing and repairing and maintaining, for example, the IT, yeah. uh, the, the technological aspect. You talked about City of Gold. There is also another city called Kunuz, which has to do with marble. And, and uh, I'm just talking here about, about the, this yeah. particular sector. Mm -hmm. Are you only going to have engineers and machines? Where is the technical labor that will maximize your benefit, minimize your waste. And I, I like also, you mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, the safety aspects. The, the Egyptian labor uh, in, in prior times was always blamed for not being keen on taking the, mm. the, the precautionary aspect about measures. safety, about yeah. the, the, these measures of health, as you pointed out. So 
it's a top item in the agenda. That's why it comes as no surprise that only in recent times, the, even the name of the ministry, this is just a symbolic thing, but it, it reflects something. Ministry of Education became Ministry of Education and Technical Education. Mm -hmm. So it, it became part of, of the way we, we deliver this. Mm -hmm. And you will see people now are going to the technical education because the industry and the job market awaits them and employ them right away. Yes, uh, it awaits them and, employ, uh, and employs them right away also uh, in, uh, in special opportunities in Upper Egypt. As we do have a golden city, we have also a golden triangle. And uh, the Golden Triangle project is a very important project launching path for the development of Upper Egypt. And we had great construction projects uh, actually taking place and changing the face of Upper Egypt. The Upper Egypt, the, the, let's say the renaissance or the, the huge development that's taking, care and, uh, taking place in Upper Egypt, uh, different folds. Uh, definitely uh, the, the infrastructure, the highways, and the, the connecting of these highways to the areas of development and the economic growth to the east, to the Red Sea, to the, to the uh, touristic areas over there. Mm -hmm. And up north, we were more density of, uh, to the harbors, Ayn Sukhna Harbor and the new emerging harbor. Let's not forget the, 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 the new ad administrative capital that's a little bit to the east of Cairo, relatively speaking, is also being connected to the upper Egypt. Yeah. Uh, and you're talking about new cities, El Minya Gidida, Asyuti Gidida, Aswan. So you, you have, you are shifting the economic uh, uh, activity and the population density from the narrow part around the Nile, the 3% of our area, into new promising areas that should open uh, new opportunities for work and for labor. Yes, in a minute let's talk about building digital Egypt because we were talking about the approaches uh, in the technological sector and how this sector is actually giving a boost to the educational system as a whole. So what Very are quickly, the key words? Uh, yeah. The, the mm. key words, mm -hmm. an opportunity occurred that we used. There was challenges facing this project at the beginning, a lot of criticism, we proved our, ourselves, and here as a nation, we're talking about individual, as a nation that we are on the right track. And just I'll end by saying, this alone has shifted Egypt from in the competitive index 20 places, 20 places from other, uh, uh, on top of other countries that were competing also to be better. But because of this, uh, or trying to close this technological gap, has advanced Egypt, Egypt image and has reflected <coughs> into the, the categorization of Egypt in the competitive uh, index by at least 20 or 21 places. So it's a huge leap. This project will be ripe in two or three more years and I think we'll all be very proud of. We're always uh, going to be very proud of the leap and uh, the fruitful reform under, uh, being undertaken, taking place in our beloved country, Egypt. I thank very much Professor Dr. Mohammed Nagib Abu Zaid. A professor at AUC for all the knowledge and the important information tonight. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. And I thank you, dear viewers, for joining us. I'm Tagharit Hussain. Many thanks for watching.